How's everybody doing? All right. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we just come before you uh, to seek you, to learn more about you, Lord. Um, teach us from your word, Lord, um, and uh, how you want us to learn your word, Lord. Help us to uh, learn, not just to learn, but to apply it, Lord, um, to live by it, Lord, and, and uh, to do them, Lord, to do your commandments as, as you told us in your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so obviously we've been looking at uh, hermeneutics class, how to study the Bible. Uh, so I know last time we went over the seven midot of Hillel, and uh, it might get a little bit confusing, right? I know we gave examples. Um, so one thing I wanted to do today is kind of, for those looking to understand what Midrash is, um, but maybe stuff like the Sami Dot is a little bit hard to understand. Um, I took, I guess, the what I would call like the basic tenets of it, the basic examples of Midrash, really, and like condensed them into definitions that I think uh, really sum up how to view the Bible, how the Jews during Jesus' time, how Paul and Jesus viewed the Bible, and how they actually taught and studied it. And I think this, once we look at the Bible this way, really opens up a lot of things in Scripture. Um, so, some basic definitions, right? Um, the first is the simple meaning, and we already kind of went over that, right? Um, then there's the deeper meaning. Um, there's Analogy, typology, um, there's patterns in Scripture, there's multiple meanings to Scripture, and then there's connections of words or phrases. So if you can remember uh, these things as you're reading Scripture, really helps in understanding it. So what I mean by simple meaning, I know we went over that a little bit, right? Just the plain reading of God's Word, we already gone over it, so I won't go too much of it. Uh, we remember the terms uh, I exegesis and eisegesis, right? We read the text for what it says. We don't read our own ideas into it. Um, we draw the meaning of Scripture from the text itself. And eisegesis is the opposite of that. You're reading your own ideas into it. Um, and so we talked about inductive Bible study, so we won't really go over that, and historical grammatical, right? So just the simple meaning. We always start with that. Uh, next is the deeper meaning, right? Uh, to understand the deeper meaning in God's Word, you have to understand the plain meaning. Um, it's not Gnosticism. You don't just make stuff up randomly um, or think, oh, as I read this scripture, I had this feeling and I had this picture of something random, you know, a kitten. So, so this passage was talking about kittens, you know, just weird stuff like that. I mean, yeah, you know, that's not how you read God's Word. Um, you understand the plain meaning of what it says. Right? I'm sorry to disappoint you. You like cats, you know. <laughs> no, but um, we talked about this in our first study, right? That the Corinthians, um, Paul did, could not teach them the deep things of God because they didn't understand the simple things. They, they didn't understand basic doctrine. And we think, oh, basic doctrine. Oh, Jesus rose from the dead and you know, those sort of things. Yeah, that's, that is basic doctrine, but what Paul was referring to was don't sin against each other. Don't take advantage of each other. Those sorts of things, right? If you don't understand that, how are you going to understand God's word on a deeper level? Um, you know, as I've said before, as an example, right? Oh, brother, I want to learn all the midrash and all the secret deep things of God. Okay, great. Stop sinning. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, stop sinning. That's the first step. Oh, okay. Right? And that's even almost what the rich young ruler came to Jesus, right? I want to follow you, Jesus. Okay, sell everything you have. <laughs> Give it away. <laughs> oh, that's too hard. <laughs> All right, so the fourth analogy, typology. Now, this is where uh, people really get into um, uh, hot water, right? Because, um, because it's easy to read something in Scripture and... Uh, and uh, think that it's some sort of allegory or some sort of analogy for something going on in our lives, right? Um, for instance, probably the most common one you see, right, is uh, David and Goliath, you know. Oh, uh, 
It's, uh, it's uh, oh, that's a picture of corporate America versus the mom and pop shops, right? <laughs> you know, Walmart versus the corner store. Like, well, that, I mean, no, <laughs> it's, not, it's not what it means. Um, and, and that's where, like I said, that's where a lot of abuse, abuse really comes in. Um, so how exactly do we deal with analogies, with typology in Scripture, okay? Well, basically, um, we use the Bible itself to illustrate doctrine. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll get into that because we're going to go through some scripture later. But um, for instance, like the, the most common example really um, is the Passover lamb illustrates the atonement, atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Um, that's specific feast, right, um, illustrates what Christ did for us. So I'm using scripture to illustrate a doctrine. I'm not coming up with a doctrine off of the Passover lamb. It's illustrating something that's already stated in Scripture. Um, you know, typology uh, illustrates doctrine, right? It, it never defines. Um, Paul in Galatians 4.21 through 31, and actually in Romans, uh, Romans, Romans 9, Marco, he also talks about the uh, free woman, right? In Romans, I can't remember which, which passage it is. Well, Galatians, yeah, Galatians uh, 4, he talks about it, but also in Romans. I can't remember. Yeah, I think it's like 9, I think. But he talks about it in Romans. You can, yeah, but Paul, but Paul uses a typology, he uses an analogy of Sarah and Hagar. Hagar as, the, the Hagar representing, interestingly enough, Right, because Hebrew roots like to twist Galatians, the Hebrew roots women like to twist Galatians and say, "Oh, Paul's telling us here that we need to keep the law." Well, actually, he uses Hagar and says Hagar represents the law, represents Mount Sinai where the law was given, um, and um, she is the bond woman. She is the slave. Right? Uh, who is the free woman? The free woman is Sarah. And so, we want, who do you want to be? The son of the free woman or the son of the bond woman? Who, which, whose who's son or whose offspring are you, right? Are you of the seed of Abraham through Sarah or of the bond woman, right? Of bond, under bondage. Which one do you want to be? It's typology. He's using it as a metaphor to explain a deeper meaning to us in Scripture. Um, Another example, right? If you really want to see typology, read the book of Hebrews. Because um, Hebrews really shows us that Jesus is better than anything. Hebrews talks about how all the sacrifices, all the temple articles, all the sacrifices, all that stuff is a picture of Jesus. And how Jesus ultimately is much better than those things because he's a fulfillment of all of it, right? All those things... Uh, foreshadow Jesus. Um, and we'll get into it too. We'll get into uh, examples of this. But um, like I said, it's, it's, very, uh, it's, it's very easy to abuse because people will, like I said, oh, I'm struggling at work. So, uh, you know, my boss is Goliath and, and I'm David. And I'm going to knock him down. Well, when you read it, that's not, that's not what it's actually Saying you're you're reading your own problem into the text. When you read it, you actually see it's got a much bigger meaning than that, um, right? Uh, if we if we want to talk about analogy with with David and Goliath, right? It would be um, David obviously representing uh, Jesus. Okay, uh, we see that because he's the king, right? And from Jesus comes, or from 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 David comes Jesus. He's a type of Jesus. Um, um, Goliath, right? Uh, how much did his armor weigh? 666 sec uh, shekels total, right? He's a picture of Satan. He's a picture of Antichrist and how the Lord will destroy him. That's, that's the picture. It's not about your boss. 
not about it's not about corporate America. I, I've, I've read like business, you know, like a Jewish businessman talking about scripture that way. Uh, it's not about those things. Um, it's about Jesus and what he did. Now, once again, we don't we don't um, deny the simple meaning, the true meaning. That was an actual event that happened. I was talking to Marco about this, um, that um, that we we know somebody. It's actually a, like a Jehovah's Witness. I, I, I read I read originally from a Jehovah's Witness. Maybe Pierre, maybe you've heard this before, but but someone else that we know was trying to use this. But they like to. Um, they were saying that um, Second Thessalonians two, okay, Antichrist sends himself up in the temple. That's a picture of how uh, Satan will take over the church. Okay, I, I would agree with that, but they were denying that there would be a real temple. Okay, they were trying to say, they were trying to say, look, see, there's no real temple because this is just a picture of how Satan's going to rule the church. Well, that's true. Satan will eventually creep into the church. He's doing it now with within the church. But Paul was saying, no, the Antichrist will literally walk into the temple. The temple will be rebuilt. He will walk into it and take over it and set himself set himself up as God. So does that make does that make sense to you guys? Right? So yeah, the typology is right, but you don't deny the plain meaning. You don't deny the fact that Paul was writing a letter. He was saying something. He was, he was saying something, uh, I guess, in a sense, factual, right? You were saying that this is going to really happen. We don't say, that never happened, so, so here's the spiritual meaning behind it. That's not how it works, because they're connected. Now, we'll get into it more. I know it can be a little bit confusing. So um, let's keep going. The second definition I said is patterns. In Scripture, you see a lot of repetition, right? Um, uh, if it's repeated in Scripture, it's important. Uh, so, for example, right, the abomination of desolation. Uh, Daniel speaks of it. He's talking about uh, Antiochus Epiphanes coming to the temple, setting himself up as God. Uh, Jesus speaks about it, okay? He says, hey, that it's going to happen. He, he says, it's, which is quite interesting, right? Because Daniel says, yeah, it's going to happen. And historically it did with Antiochus. Jesus says, oh, the abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel going to happen. And it's just like, wait, wait, Jesus, didn't it happen already though? And Jesus says, no, it's going to happen, right? So it's a second time. Then Paul alludes to it in 2 Thessalonians. So there's, there's patterns in Scripture. Uh, if you read through Scripture, what do you see? You see um, the history of Israel is a pattern, right? They backslide. God judges them. They cry to the Lord. They're good for a while. They backslide. They cry, you know, God judges them. <laughs> they cry to the Lord. It's a pattern. You see that in Scripture. And so um, ultimately, though, um, there's patterns, but the patterns don't keep going on and on and on. There's an ultimate fulfillment. And that's what, that's what Jesus saw. That's what Paul saw with the abomination and desolation. Every time, um, you know, every, every time a false teaching is given in the church, that's a picture of, that's an abomination of desolation, right? Uh, something evil coming into the house of God. Um, it's a picture of that. But there's going to be an ultimate fulfillment. There's going to be a real Antichrist, a real person, and dwelt by Satan that comes into a temple, into the temple to be, to be worshipped by God. See, now the problem is people sometimes say, yeah, there's patterns in Scripture, but they just keep going. Oh, Israel came back in 1948. That's just a pattern. It doesn't mean anything. You know, um, you know Israel, Israel always sins. They always backslide. Oh, they're backsliding right now. See, the pattern's there. Yes, it is there, but there's an ultimate fulfillment. So that's, so that's, um, that's patterns, okay? So, um, and, and we'll explain more because you should be looking for patterns in Scripture, not just historically, but also uh, we'll get into it more. We'll, we'll get into it more in just a moment. Um, and I think, like I said, I think the next few weeks I'm going to be teaching in ways to demonstrate and show you guys how this is done. So the other example, the other definition I would give is multiple meanings, right? Um, there's... More than one interpretation. Ooh, people, now, now this is where people go, what? What are you saying? This isn't true. The Bible can only be interpreted one way. Okay, so um, is that how Jesus interpreted the Bible? Is that how Paul interpreted the Bible? Okay. Um, once again, right, the story of 
Hagar and, and, and Sarah and Isaac and Ishmael. We can just read it at its plain meaning and maybe not get much out of it, right? Because it's, because it's, it's just, an, if you want to look at it this way, right? I'm not saying this is what it is, but, but oh, it's just an old story and it's, and, and uh, you know, uh, oh, it's a great drama, right? Uh, uh, between, between different people. Oh, and oh, what a great story. Um, but is that how Paul interprets it? Oh, it just means this one thing. No, he says, hey, it also is a picture of Hagar and Ishmael, right? Um, but more than one interpretation. Um, and here's the example, right? This is how the Jews view Scripture. Um, and Marco talked about this, right? There's four views of the end times. The first is idealism, okay, that, um, or poeticism, that the book of Revelation, right, is just a nice story, a good encouragement to help us in hard times of trouble. Amen. I, I would agree with that. Um, then there's futurism, right, which we believe as well, that, yeah, we're Revelation speaking about future events. Amen. Yeah, it is. It's giving us end times prophecy and all that, right? Um, then there's historicism. Well, Revelation is a picture of things going on in history, the patterns, right, in history. Uh, very interesting, right? Because um, if you look at, um, you, you know, for, for a long time with, with the Reformation and all that, people read the Bible in a very straight way, right? They, they read the Bible, historical, grammatical, exegesis, like that. Um, you know, there were, there were, there was people that looked at typology and everything, but but Bible prophecy itself, especially end times Bible prophecy, was not taken very seriously until a certain event happened. Napoleon was in Megiddo, right? There was a battle there. <laughs> and um, basically, uh, they, they, they looked at Napoleon and they said, hey, this guy looks just like the Antichrist. He's, you know, if you, if you look in Scripture, there's, there's boxes describing the Antichrist. Check them off. Napoleon fulfills all of these, right? And the people started to take Bible prophecy very seriously. Um, but was Napoleon that uh, Napoleon the? I keep wanting to say Napoleon Dynamite. Sorry, it keeps going in my head. But was Napoleon Bonaparte the Antichrist? He was not. And there's other pictures. There's other people that came after him: Stalin, Hitler, Saddam Hussein, right? Going after the Jewish people, um, you know. Uh, Obama, <laughs> you know, uh, but, were, but were any of those people the Antichrist? No. Now, once again, it's wrong to say, well, there's always been Antichrist as a pattern. See, historicism, it's a pattern through history. Um, well, I mean, it's true, but there's an ultimate fulfillment, right? The last one is preterism. Preterism basically says, oh, all the events of Revelation happened, Nero was the Antichrist. Uh, and all those things happened in 70 AD the destruction of, during the destruction of the temple, um, which partly I would agree with, right? Like Nero was an Antichrist. But once again, here's four views of the end times. Which one is true? You have to pick one. Well, is that true? No, because when you look at Scripture, when you study Scripture, you see that all four of them are true at the same time. There's multiple meanings, multiple ways to look at Scripture. Um, you know, and when we talk about things like typology, right, if you want an example in Scripture, um, you know, you can, read, you can read the story of Solomon at face value, right, and you can see that he was a great man of God, and he backslid, but in the end he repented. Amen, right? That's a, that's a good, that's, I mean, we don't, we don't want to backslide, but it shows God's grace and mercy that a backslider can come to repentance, okay? That's the plain meaning, but when you start looking at Solomon's life, you start seeing some things. Right? He was king, he built the temple, and there was peace in the land while he was king. What does that sound like? Huh? Well, almost. We'll talk about that right now. It sounds like Jesus, right? The temple will be built, he will be king over the land, right? And there will be peace, right? It's a picture of Jesus. But then, on the other hand, um, he was a sorcerer. He brought idolatry. When he backs the right, he brought idolatry into the land. Um, uh, in his palace, he had 12 lions sitting on six steps, six lions on each side of his throne. Six, six, six. 
he's also a picture of Antichrist. Really interesting, right? He's both. Another example, uh, Absalom, the son of David. Okay, um, He was wicked, right? Uh, I believe through, um, through his hair, he was trying to kind of show that he was a religious man. Because Nazarites, right? The vow of the Nazarite, they would not cut their hair. And, and that was a sign. If you saw somebody with long hair in those days, you didn't think, oh, wow, man, what kind of conditioner did you use? No, you, you thought, this man's a holy, holy man. He's, he's, he's doing the Nazarite vow, right? That's what you would think of, okay? Um, so he had false religion. Um, what else? Oh, he tried to usurp. He tried to take place, but to take uh, take the place of David, King David, right? Tried to take the place of his father. So obviously, a picture of Antichrist. But what else? You read more into Absalom's life. What, what do you see? Well, how did he die? He hung on a tree. Okay. Um. um what else? Oh, um, what does Joab tell David after Absalom dies? He tells David this, okay? Um, you would have been happy if all Israel had died, but Absalom had lived. Right? Um, well, also, David, being a father, wept for his son, right? Um, for how wicked he was. Well, when we look at the typology, who else hung on the tree? Well, no, well, Jesus. Jesus. Okay. Um, what did Caiaphas say? He said, it's better for one man to die for the people. Okay, Joab tells David, hey, if basically, right, he's the same theme. Your son died and all Israel lived, basically, right? David would have kept it going. Now, as far as his David crying for his wicked son, well, Jesus became sin, right? So that we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, now it would be far, and now, so you guys see that Absalom is a picture of both things. Okay, there's Two different meanings, okay? Um, now, well, I'll just, I'll just say it on a side note, but, right, this, like I said, this is where things can get abused because someone can say, well, you, you have to understand that there's, there's a point where the analogy stops, okay? Because it would then be wrong for me to say, well, Jesus was then also a wicked man, right? That's not, that's, that's a ridiculous Conclusion, right? To say, oh, uh, David cried for, for Absalom, his son, um, and Absalom is a typology of Jesus, therefore Jesus was also wicked. No, that's, right? That's abuse, okay? But yet, you can still see similar, similarities between both. So, I know, I'm sorry if, like, it's heavy stuff, but, but we'll, we'll, get into, we'll get into more right now, right? So, the last way to um, kind of look at scripture, right, is to connect words and phrases. So, um, in the Western mind, we connect context. Okay, we say this passage is talking about this subject. This other passage is also talking about this subject. Therefore, they're connected. That's how we read. Okay, um, I'll give an example right now. The Jewish mind doesn't just connect context, it connects words, phrases, and I would actually add the word themes there. For example, baptism, okay? Um, with baptism, we know that, uh, in, that there's different places in Scripture, right, that talk about baptism. If we were to look at... If we were to look at um, you know, you don't have to turn there, but Colossians 2, 1 Peter 3, 
1 Corinthians 10 and Romans 2 all talk about baptism. So our Western mind says, oh, those are the only places in Scripture that talk about baptism. Well, that's not how the Jewish mind looks at it. The Jewish mind connects words, phrases, themes, places, okay? Um, for example, with baptism, right? Um, this could be a whole study within, it, within itself. I won't get into the, the typology too much, but um, what is, um, where do we really first see baptism in the New Testament? Yeah, John the Baptist, right? Where was he baptizing? Jordan River. So then, one thing you would want to look at, go back in the Old Testament. Where do you see the Jordan River? Well, we see the Jordan River uh, when the Levites were crossing the Jordan River and they walked with the ark, right? Right before they were walking to the promised land with Joshua, you see the Levites crossing with the Ark of the Covenant. And we talked about this at the men's study. We also see Naaman, he's a Gentile with leprosy, and the prophet Elisha tells him to go and dip himself in the Jordan River seven times. Interesting, right? Sounds like baptism to me. Um, there's also Elijah and Elisha both crossed the Jordan before Elijah was raptured. Um, so, like I said, that would be a study in of itself to understand how those things relate to baptism. But most people wouldn't look at Scripture that way. They, wouldn't say, they would just say, oh, these passages in the New Testament that we had named talk about baptism. That's all we need. Well, we can learn more about baptism by looking at these other ones. Uh, but that's not the point of today's passage. So with that, let's... Um, Let's go to John uh, 4. So here's really where our study is kind of going to... Oh, man. I have a King James Version. Forgot my Bible today. This has a small writing, too. So we read John 4, right? The story of the woman at the well. And if we read it, we see some things, right? We see some things happening. And so, John 4, okay? So we see Jesus, okay? And he meets a woman at a well, and we went over this a couple weeks ago, right? So I'm not going to go over the whole, the summary of the whole passage, but Jesus meets a woman at a well, gives her, or offers her water, right? Living water, really. Um, he deals with her sin and with her doctrine. Okay? So when we look at this John, the story in John 4, this is what we basically see, okay? Jesus meets a woman at the well, he offers her water, deals with her sin, and then with her doctrine, right? There can be a lot more to it, but this is the example I'm going to use. Um, if I'm preparing for a passage or a teaching, or if I was going to teach on this passage, this is how I would start, okay? This is my main passage. And what I start to do then is I start to look for, for similar words or themes in other passages, okay? So we go to, oh, let me look at my notes here. Actually, you know what? I have them up here. Here we go. Use the cheat sheet. Um, John 10. Eleven through sixteen, right? So I'm going to write it here in the corner.
Because, okay, so like, so one thing we talked about, right, the theme we had talked about before was um, when we read this story at face value, the Jesus at the well, we can, we can come to the conclusion, hey, when Jesus was witnessing to somebody, right, a woman, not only that, but a Samaritan, right? Okay. He was preaching to those who were outside. He was preaching to outcasts, people didn't want to hang out with, okay? Um, when he witnessed to her, he dealt with her sin and her false doctrine, right? That, just, that's just the basics. Like I said, there's a lot more to it, but trying to condense it. Okay. So then... When you read John 10, you see what? You see Jesus. Okay. He calls himself a uh, yeah, good shepherd. Okay. Let's see here. Da -da -da -da. Okay. And then another character. I get, you know, another, he mentions the Father. The Father knows him, right? Um, Jesus is the good shepherd. The Father knows him as the good shepherd, right? Um, yeah, there's sheep, okay, obviously. There's hirelings. And then there's wolves, right? Okay. So like I said, that's the basic summary of this passage in John 10. Um, so, so far it's like, okay, well, what does this have to do with, with this? Well, let's continue, okay? Like I said, the, in, our, in, in our Western mind, we go, okay, Jesus says he's a good shepherd, great. Here Jesus talks to a Samaritan woman, great. But the two passages aren't connected, right? Context, contextually speaking. Okay, like if you're doing a book report, you know, uh, Sergio, what is, you know, explain to me John 4. Oh, you know, I, you couldn't connect these two. But let's keep going. John 7, okay. And it looks like John, sorry, I have bad writing. John 7. Once again, we have, but there is a connection though, right? Because we have here Jesus, Jesus. And here we have Jesus, okay? Um, he talks about living water, right? He is the fountain, okay? Jesus is the fountain, and the living water is the Holy Spirit, right? All right, now this event Contextually, is completely different from this event, okay? But there's a connection, right? You have Jesus, and you have, uh, let's see here, there you go, water, living water, to be exact. So there's a connection, okay? But once again, contextually, they're... they're Three chapters away, right? They're, the Western mind doesn't read it that way, but there is a connection, okay? So let's go to um, Genesis 29, okay? So Genesis 29, we have... Jacob, right? Yep. And then we have, huh? Okay, Rachel. I'll put it this way. We have a woman. We have a well. Okay. Water. What else do we have? Sheep, right? We have sheep. Okay. So when you read this story, all of a sudden, wait, our connections are starting to happen, right? So Jesus is the fountain of living water. So Jacob 
right? We have a man here named Jacob, but in here we have a man named Jesus, okay? We have, oh man, this is going to be here. <laughs> we have a woman, okay? Man, I'm going to need more colors. We have a well. We have water. And, but we're going to connect it to up here, right? Because we have sheep. But there's something interesting, right? Because also in Genesis 29, there's men. But the men don't water the sheep. Jacob is the one that waters the sheep. So now we have guys that don't care about the sheep, right? We have hirelings. Okay? And then obviously here we have this. I won't go, I won't go into it too much. But next is Exodus 2. Okay, so who, who do we have in Exodus 2? We have Moses. Okay, we have, well, water, yes. We have a well. We have women. Okay, we have, huh? Yeah, so we have, I'll say bad shepherds. Okay, that's really what they are. So what do we have here now, right? Actually, I'll use the red marker for this one. So now we have Moses. We have a man, right, who meets some women, right, or a woman at a well, okay? Remember, the, the theme is still there. So yeah, this is a little different, but the theme is still there. A man meets a woman, or a man meets women at a well, okay, at the well. So we have the well here. This is getting too confusing. I can stop doing this. I think we're getting to the point, right? But here, we have something else. There's bad shepherds, right? Wolves or even hirelings, right? Moses fights off the bad shepherds in order to give water. And actually, there's a sheep, right? Water to the sheep. Down here. So the point of the arrows is to explain the connections, right? But I think we're getting, we're getting the point, right? So I don't need to do all that. Um, okay. So once again, in the Western mind, these passages have nothing to do with each other. Like this one's about Jacob. What is it, what is it even about, right? This one's about Moses. Okay, Moses was a swell guy, right? That's what we get out of it. This one's about Jesus claim to be living water. Amen, right? Um, but yet, when we read these different passages in Scripture and we look at them together, we see that the Scripture itself opens up itself so much more than just reading it like if it was a book report. Does that make sense? Because what do we see here? We see all these as pictures of Jesus. Um, because what is, okay, so what does a good shepherd do? A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. A good shepherd takes care of the sheep. Ultimately, that's what Jesus does. He dies, right? He dies, he lays down his life for the sheep. We, we already know that in Scripture. Um, but also, uh, a shepherd is a picture of a teacher, right? Um, here, well, we can see it better here, right, in Exodus 2. Moses is fighting off hirelings, Okay. He's fighting off what? What are, what are hirelings um, a, a picture of? They're a picture of bad pastors, bad teachers. Or even, you know, Pierre, you said wolves, right? Bad teachers, teachers that want to lead you astray. That's what, they're, that's what they're a picture of. Jesus, as a good shepherd, right, drives away the wolves. He, he goes after the wolves. Well, right, they give bad doctrine. Well, what was Jesus doing here with the woman at the well? He was teaching her good doctrine. He was teaching her, right? He was, in a sense, driving off 
the wolves, striving off satanic doctrine. Okay? Now, if you do some research, this is where also looking at um, the history of it is important because the Samaritans, okay? So remember we talked about Antiochus Epiphanes. He goes into the temple, and or he, he basically wanted to go into the temple and set, him, set up a, a statue of Zeus, you know, with uh, features like himself. So he's trying to say that he was God. The Maccabees led a revolt and fought him off. Um, quite interesting, because if you look at history, he did the same thing to the Samaritans. They, had, they actually had their own temple. And the Samaritans were like, hey, it's cool. You know, we'll, we'll even call it the Temple of Jupiter. Don't worry about it. Right? Yet, here she is saying, oh, we worship on the real mountain. Lady, you got false doctrine. That's, what, that's, that's why Jesus was saying what he said, right? Salvation comes from the Jews. You have false doctrine. Look at, look at your history. Look at what your people did. They, they completely walked away from God. They compromised. Your doctrine is false. Jesus as the good shepherd, right? Here's Jesus. He's the good shepherd. He fights off just like Moses fought off and fought off the bad shepherds. Jesus fought off or the bad shepherds. He fought off wolves, right, to protect the sheep, this woman. Okay. Well, Sergio, uh, doesn't doesn't the sheep call the lost sheep of Israel? Well, Jesus also said, "I have sheep from another flock." Right, Gentiles. Okay, this one was a Samaritan. Um, quite interesting because I know I know I didn't write it in here, but Moses, right? Uh, uh, after he rescues the women with our Jethro's daughters, his becomes his father-in-law, right? Um, what do the women say? Oh, a, a stranger came and rescued us. Well, Jesus was a stranger to the Samaritan woman. He came and he rescued her, right? Um, Moses gives water to the sheep. Moses offers water to this woman. Jacob meets a woman at the well, right? He also, right, the hirelings were lazy. They didn't want to open the water for the sheep. But Jacob, he meets Rachel, the woman at the well, gives her water, gives her sheep water. Right? He cared about, he was a shepherd, Moses was a shepherd. They cared about the sheep. Um, so what were they doing then? They were giving water to the sheep, but what does that say about shepherds? Right? Jesus, he's the fountain of living water. In a sense, he's the well. He gives the water. Right? The water itself is the Holy Spirit. He was offering her eternal life. He was offering her, when uh, when a pastor is a good shepherd, like Jesus, he's giving eternal life to the people, right? When he teaches the truth, God's truth, God gives eternal life, right, through that. You know, I'm not saying, right, we have a cult down the street right now, and they think that, that their apostles is giving them eternal life. No, Christ alone gives eternal life. But true doctrine, when you believe in Christ because of the true doctrine, Eternal life is given, right, through Christ using us, okay? So we see how a little story in John 4, yeah, it's a great story, and it teaches us a great lesson about evangelism and how to deal with people when we talk with them. But when you read Scripture as a whole, see, it's amazing to me because the, the Bible was written over a period of of uh, 2,000 years, right, Marco? 2,000? Okay, I was about to say 6,000. I'm like, wait, that's off. 2,000 years by 40 different people, right? How is it that, you know, of course, John wrote these, Moses, right? Like, they're, they're apart by thousands of years, yet it all comes together to teach us something, okay? See, this is why it's important to read Scripture. If you just read the book of John all day, amen, it's a blessing, but you're missing out. See, in your walk, when you read Genesis, you'll see this. And then later on down the road, you'll read the book of John and go, oh, I remember. I re oh, I remember what Jesus did. Oh, I remember what Moses did. Oh, I, re I remember all these things. Okay? And you, you see how they start, they start coming together. Now, we're, we're going to go through more of this, right? And... and um, you know, and what's, and, that, and what's the encouragement, right? I mean, there's different, 
levels of application, right? One is for, one could be for, for this church, right? Our pastor is a, is a good shepherd. He, he wants to be like Jesus. He wants to teach the truth. Amen, right? Um, but also, uh, you know, I think when I taught this originally, I taught it, I taught it to the men. Um, uh, you know, as men, we should be taking care of our family, right? We have, I'm about to have a little sheep, a little lamb in my home, right? A little baby. Um, I need to take care, make sure no, no doctrine, no, no wrong doctrine, you know, comes into the home. Um, you know, um, there's a lot of things. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think what else. You know, there's, there's like, on, on Monday nights, we've been doing this with the men. It's, it's more open. It's more just trying to teach them. Um, what, Marco? Solomon. Oh, yeah, my son. Yeah, my baby's name is Solomon. So, I mean, you'll, you'll know that. But, um, Marco, is there anything else you can think of? I'm now, now I'm like in like, see, see like, like when, it, when, when you look at scripture like this, it's like, it's like I start thinking about it. I start meditating. On it, and I start start like, oh, what what else can we see in scripture that that goes with this? What other themes do we see? You know, it's just it, it, this is this is what midrash is, right? It's not. Did, did this seem mystical to you at all? Was I going, oh, you know, oh, I found the secrets of life, and 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 oh, I'm one with the universe now. No, it's it's we're just reading God's word. <laughs> we're reading God's word, and like I said tonight, right? I said uh, midrash. Talks about an analogy, right? We can see how Moses is like Jesus. Why? Because there's a similar theme going on here and here. Okay, we can see how Jacob is like Jesus because there's a similar theme going on here. Um, that's that's typology. Okay, you can see the patterns, right? Because <laughs> it happens here. It happens here to Moses, and then it happens here, right? You can see the connections of words or phrases, you know, good shepherd, shepherd, sheep, water, well, like just everywhere, okay? Um, you, you can see those things. So those definitions I gave tonight, maybe it was like confusing, like, wait, what does Sergio mean? Uh, but when you, when you read scripture and you start seeing it like this, now it makes sense. Oh, this is, this is, this is what it is. And so um, with that, do you guys have any questions or... You know, Marco, you have anything else maybe you see in Scripture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, so some typology, I'm going to say it just because people on the live stream. But Marco talked about how interesting that that the Lord is trying to win his bride over, right? And so in this case, we have a Gentile. <laughs> Jesus wants to win her over to salvation, right? Not, not, not saying Jesus wants to marry her, but he wants to win her over, right? That's what a picture is. With Moses, we also see he ends up marrying a Gentile, right? Jesus marries ultimately a Gentile bride, the church. So there's, there's a pattern there, there as well, right? Um, let's see, I'm trying to think what else, but... Um, I don't know. I think. Oh, yeah, there's that too. But I forget what the typology is on that one because it's a picture of the, the rock of the tomb, right? Yeah, so actually, so when Jacob opens, yeah, that's right. So when Jacob opens the, um, when Jacob gets water to the sheep, uh, he's actually rolling a stone away from the mouth of a, of a well, right? It's like a picture of Jesus in his resurrection. So the, the stone rolling away and then, well, then the water comes, right? It wasn't until Jesus, did the Spirit come when Jesus was alive? Was the Spirit poured out? No, not until he died. So when Jesus died and the stone was rolled away and he resurrected, then the Spirit was given. See the typology, right? Because the living water is the Holy Spirit. See, once again, we're, this, like I said, Midrash, I'm not making it up. I'm not making it up and saying, oh, the water represents the Spirit. No, Jesus says the living water is the Spirit. This he's this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah tells us in the Old Testament, it's the Holy Spirit, right? Um, so that's when I say, right? When I say that typology, analogies, they is illustrate doctrine. This is what we're talking about. These things are illustrating doctrine, okay? 
Um, and as we saw too, right, these things can have multiple, they're connected, but they can have multiple meanings, right, especially when you're connecting them all together. So, let's see, what time is it? Well, with that, you know, like I, like I said, I know these are more kind of like classes. Uh, over the next few weeks, uh, I'll be giving more teachings more or less like this. Um, just, to, just to help you guys in studying. Like I said, like if, if, if you just want to come here and just think, oh, I'm, I'm going to listen to Sergio and, and learn Midrash and that's how I'm going to learn it, then don't come to this class because you need to read your Bible. If you're going to leave and say, I'm going to read my Bible and come back, amen. But anyone that just wants to listen or like, oh, I just want to fill my head with knowledge, it, it doesn't matter. Go out and apply this stuff. Be a good shepherd. Be a, you know, be like Christ. <laughs> give, give, give the living water to people, right? So, anyways, with that, let's pray. And then uh, Marco, everyone's been asking Marco for a prophecy update. So Marco will be up next. So Lord, we just come before you. We uh, thank you, Lord, that there are so many great things in your word. Or that you have... Uh, Hidden treasures, Lord, as you, as you said, Lord. And um, we thank you that you've given us your spirit, Lord, that teaches us these things. Lord. But we ask, Lord, that uh, we would teach not just to, uh, or that we, we, we would be taught not just to learn, uh, but to also go out and do these things, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.